India has showcased launch capability. India has pretty mature satellite capability. And now India has the capability to get to the moon and can use that technology for further missions. Only right now is, uh, are the Indian Armed Forces taking space very seriously. Uh, however, uh, because India was uh, not focusing on military space capabilities for quite a long time, uh, the actual capabilities that India has on the military front in space are quite limited. China can destroy Indian satellite support structures if it wants to. Globalize. India is on the moon. It might be a sign of a new space race heating up. India is not only on the moon. India is also aiming for the sun. And in fact, there's a Venus mission planned for next year. We'll be discussing that today on Globalize, a new take on security policy. I'm Isha Bhatia Sanan. I'm senior editor here at Deutsche Welle. And it's not just space and technology and science, it's also security and geostrategic implications. I'm William Glucroft, GW security reporter. And looking at this topic with us, we have two great guests today. One is Namrata Goswami. She is an author and a professor at the Thunderbird School of Management at the Arizona State University, joining us from the U.S. state of Alabama. And joining us from Delhi is Pranav Satyanath. He is security policy researcher at CSDR, that's Council for Strategic and Defense Research. And he's going to speak to us in personal capacity today. Thank you for joining both of you. So, Namrata, I'd like to start with the most cliched question, if I may call that. So every time we hear about the Indian space mission, we have some people in the West, some experts criticizing that India has got its own problems. Why does India have to uh, spend so much on space? And we've really heard that a lot of times. And for me, for someone who's born and brought up in India and who's now in the West, I see the difference in perception. So I see that India likes um, to be seen from this 21st century view, whereas the West try still tries to see India from this 20th century uh, glasses. So... Let's just get this once and for all. What's the answer to that? What does India have to say to this? Uh, well, thank you for that question, and I'm glad you started with that. So um, I agree with you that the question is basically determined by the visualization of India when it became independent in 1947, when it was not a very rich country. So I think fast forward to today, uh, India is the fifth largest economy in the world, and also the fact that India's space program historically has been conceptualized to contribute to the national development. So I think this question is also born out of ignorance as to what space actually does. So usually when the question is asked, people think about just moon missions and Mars missions and cannot connect it to what space actually contributes to society. But if you look at India's space program, there are three critical contributions that it has done since it was established in 1969. One is weather forecasting, which is critical for India, given the fact that it's a largely agricultural country in which uh, farmers and those who actually contribute to national food development takes the help of space. Second, it contributes to this very critical concept of navigation. Uh, India is dependent on ex import of a large number of uh, oil and gas, for example, and space plays a very critical role in navigation. And finally, I think space has played a critical role historically in terms of offering uh, e-education, uh, e-commerce uh, e today. But I grew up in a very remote area of India, and one way I actually learned about science and technology was listening to, for example, uh, satellite-based programs on Doordarshan. So I don't think people realize that, that space has played such a critical role in societal development historically and today even more uh, with the kind of e-commerce uh, digitization that India is seeing. So let's rest that question once and for all. Right. I'm glad you've uh, broken it down for us because our podcast, basically what we try to do is that we take these big issues and we try to explain how those big issues impact people and their lives. So you've talked about e-education, about navigation, about weather forecasts. Now, before we move further, another cliched question. I'm sorry that I'm starting with such cliched questions, but another thing that really takes the West by surprise is the cost effectiveness. So every time a space mission is talked about, we see the comparison. I have an example here. NASA Blue Origin Lunar Lander is supposed to cost $75 billion, whereas the Chandrayaan merely costs $75 million. So if, by comparison, if one space mission is less than a Hollywood or a Bollywood movie these days, are we going to see more of them? That's one. And two, why and how are they so cost effective? 
I think the reason why India has uh, such a cost-effective space program is because of the fact that it launches very practical missions. So uh, let's compare, for example, the Chandrayaan-3 mission, which cost about $75 million, and the NASA missions, for example, the Artemis missions, that will cost about $94 billion by the time they accomplish it. And so a single launch of the rocket itself, the space launch system, cost about $4 billion. So now the question uh, very valid to ask is why is that so? So India's Chandrayaan-3 mission was practical. It's a much lower weight mission, so you need much less fuel to launch it, which means cost comes down. Second, the cost of manufacturing is much cheaper than, for example, manufacturing rockets here in the United States. And then finally, the more important point is that the salary of Indian space research organizations and others is not comparable to the kind of salary that is re required to retain talent, for example, within NASA. So these are very critical reasons why India's space mission is lower. And then I think the final reason is that ISRO itself has taken decisions not to do the kind of uh, missions that showcases Heavy lift, for example, which uh, is the a rocket that can take very high weight to space. Instead, what you do is that you actually demonstrate capability by using practical lighter weight missions. And I think those are the reasons why India's space program is so cost effective. And so to answer your question about is this going to be a model? Yes, because if you look at the world today, there are about 74 space uh, missions, uh, 74 countries that are interested in space. The African Union just established the African Space Agency in January this year. And what they are looking for are missions that are cost effective, that are that they're able to fund, but also that are able to demonstrate very high end technology like soft landing on the lunar surface, because that builds the entire space ecosystem. So the Indian space program is a is a critical model that other nations would like to emulate. But as India develops further missions, wants to put people into space, wants to, and as, as generally space programs want to go further into space, will those cost sense creep up? So Pranav, do you see the low cost model as something that can actually be sustained, especially when we're talking about humans in space, which of course is a whole different story than putting robots into space? I think the low cost model is still quite sustainable. Uh, like Dr. Goswami said, um, India tries to have programs that are practical, that uh, demonstrate lesser capabilities. So India does not aim for very advanced capabilities, but capabilities that it can achieve uh, and get practical science out of it. And uh, thirdly, uh, India also has, ISRO also has uh, contractors uh, who have built relationship with ISRO for about since the 1980s. So these are really small contractors. There are about 4,000 companies that manufacture various sorts of components from wiring to uh, heat shielding. So uh, all these companies also make sure that uh, these are very low cost. Uh, all these things come together, uh, similarly contribute to the human space type program, Gaganyaan. Uh, of course, um, Indian model is also quite different because uh, in the United States, uh, it's based on cost plus contracts. Whereas in India, ISRO is the primary manufacturer, so they have to stick within budgets. Uh, so ISRO does not depend on contracting uh, the, the building and design of uh, human space flight modules because it builds most of this in-house and most of the design is carried out in-house. Uh, they're able to control the costs to a much greater extent. Uh, of course, if ISRO does want, want to uh, ca ca carry out missions such as the per Perseverance rover, which has sev severely advanced instruments, uh, ISRO will have to up its game and spend a lot more uh, in order to stay competitive uh, if it wants to do more ambitious uh, science, uh, especially in the interplanetary missions. Okay, Pranav, we've, uh, you've mentioned the Chandrayaan and uh, the Gaganyaan also briefly. Now, since we are not a science podcast, we'll not get very much in the technicalities of it, but we do have listeners and viewers from all over the, uh, the world who would not really know what was a Chandrayaan 1 or a Chandrayaan 3. So if you could just briefly tell the difference from where has India started and where has it reached and what's the future plan like? So when ISRO was set up in 1969, um, the Indian space program was broadly aimed at placing satellites uh, in low Earth orbit uh, and geosynchronous orbit. This meant uh, broadcasting satellites and weather satellites and communication satellites. Uh, but around 2000, uh, the Indian Astronautical Association uh, had this ambitious plan to 
have India's first uh, interplanetary uh, mission or lunar mission. So in the year 2000, uh, during the Prime Minister Vajpayee administration, uh, India announced that it was going to uh, send a probe to the moon. And this probe was the Chandrayaan-1. The Chandrayaan-1 was a very simple mission. It carried instruments from uh, different laboratories in the United States. And uh, it was a probe that landed in the South Pole, and it used some of the American instruments to find water ice. So this was some of the break, breakthrough moments. Chandrayaan-2 was a more advanced mission where it required a rover and a lander. So the uh, the rover, lander, and a orbiter. So the orbiter was uh, in charge of taking uh, photos of the moon, and the rover and lander were supposed to land and carry out some basic science. Uh, of course, uh, in 2019, in September 2019, Chandrayaan-1 uh, was only a pop, was only a partial success because the lander did not have a soft landing on the moon, and so the lander and rover were destroyed. So India wanted to carry out uh, retry this mission, and that and that's what is the Chandrayaan three, but uh, this time it was more successful. They had uh, quite a few design changes and redundancies in- introduced to the spacecraft so that it make it is hundred uh, percent that it ensures a far greater rate of success. Uh, and this is what the Chandrayaan-3 is. Chandrayaan-3 is a near copy of the previous mission, Chandrayaan-2, but with certain modifications. So, and, you know, we're recording on Wednesday, the 27th of September, so things can certainly change. But what is the current status of, of that mission? Currently, the Chandrayaan-3 rover uh, is facing difficulty switching on because it was asleep for 14 days uh, because uh, it was not getting sunlight. So the solar panels were not able to grab the sunlight and recharge the batteries. So right now, ISRO is having quite a bit of difficulty in switching on the rover uh, because uh, they're not able to uh, make sure that the batteries are fully charged. Namrata, there are currently seven missions on or around the moon. I'd like to understand how do they cooperate if they do and if they collaborate with each other? Is information and data exchanged and how is that used? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, if you think about the missions that are today present on the lunar surface. One is, of course, China's Chang'e 4, uh, which is actually a very critical demonstration of technology by China. So the fact that China was able to uh, operationalize its U-2 rover, uh, that is, it was put on sleep mode and then it was awakened after 14 uh, lunar nights, as Pranav mentioned tells you that China has a capability to continue missions beyond the frigid temperature of the lunar night. So uh, in terms of collaboration, uh, there is actually no official collaboration between the Chinese space program and the Indian space program that is on the moon. Uh, And so we have no data on that. So China, of course, has offered data to the world in terms of what the Chang'e 4, which is the first mission that landed on the far side of the moon, is uh, discovering on the lunar far side, which is the side that faces away from us and where no nation had landed before. So uh, we we do not have uh, any uh, idea as to what kind of collaboration or data sharing is happening there. But having said that, what is interesting is that both the Chandrayaan-3 mission and China's Chang'e missions have put out data individually so that scientists can actually access it and see what they are finding. Now, in terms of the mission that Japan has launched, it's a critical mission. They just launched uh, last month, uh, or this month, sorry. And so uh, the Japanese mission is about showcasing a technology that is going to make missions critical for lunar exploration. So they are testing uh, a a technology that is going to land on the lunar surface where you decide to land, not because a landing site is safe or that you visually decide on the spot where to go because you do not want to land on craters. So that is what the mission is about. Japan and India is actually collaborating in terms of their space program. Uh, They have signed uh, agreements to go to the moon in the next few years and to land on the South Pole this time and confirm the presence of water ice. So there is collaboration. And then finally, the most critical collaboration that is happening is between uh, the US, uh, India, Japan included, Uh, and South Korea included that wants to also land and take uh, missions to the moon is through the Artemis Accords. So as you know, the U.S. initiated the Artemis Accords that is about not just sending humans to the moon, but also 
uh, lunar resource utilization. For example, the moon has resources like water ice, uh, titanium, aluminum, iron ore. So that's the goal of that mission. And India signed that accord in June this year. And Japan is the founding uh, participatory nation of that accord. So there is going to be a deep amount of data sharing because of that accords. And uh, as you know, Germany also signed, becoming the 29th nation to sign it. So those are the kind of collaborations that I see happening on the moon today. Namrata, if you could shed some more light on the international space treaties. You just mentioned that um, there are these elements on moon and the rover has found sulfur, aluminium, silicon, calcium, iron, etc. So what are these international space treaties like? So if I go on the moon and I find these things, do I have the right to just mine them, bring them back? Or are there some treaties in place that say, no, this is how you have to go about it and you can't do certain things? These are the rules like. Sure. So the major treaty that most nations have signed is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And so according to the Outer Space Treaty, you can peacefully utilize space, but you cannot claim national sovereignty. So it's very clear. It does not prohibit nations from utilizing space resources, for example. There is nothing that is stated with clarity in the treaty. But uh, And so if you, for example, go to the South Pole of the Moon and then say that this is my territory, you cannot do that. But you can utilize it for your own uh, benefit and for the benefit of uh, humankind, as the treaty says. Uh, the Moon Treaty is much more specific, but then most spacefaring nations, including uh, China, Russia, the United States, and India uh, have not ratified it. India signed it, but did not ratify it. So it does not, uh, it's not obligated. So then to answer your question as to what happens then, if you go and land on say the lunar South Pole, and then you have the technology to extract resources. So what nations have done, which is within the obligation of the Outer Space Treaty, that is that they have uh, put forward national legislations and laws. For example, the US was the first nation to initiate the commercial uh, uh, launch, uh, so competitive launch uh, asteroid act, which as it is known. And so that was uh, initiated in 2015. And according to that particular legislation that actually was signed into law by former President Barack Obama, uh, an American citizen or a company, if it goes to a particular celestial body, can keep the resources that they mine and profit from it. Now, Luxembourg has a very similar legislation that was passed in 2016 that offers not just Luxembourg citizens, but also companies that set up shop there to uh, keep the resources that they would mine, for example, on a celestial body. And uh, many companies and countries have signed memorandum of understanding with Luxembourg to take advantage, including Japan and uh, China. And then finally, very critically, Japan passed a space mining legislation uh, in December of 2021 that enables, for example, a Japanese company like iSpace that wants to go and uh, mine resources on the moon to keep it. And then India's space policy 2023 has a very interesting paragraph. In that paragraph, it says that any Indian citizen or a non-governmental entity if it has the capability to go to an asteroid and mine a resource there, can actually keep those resources. So there is clarity and, for ex and so practice can become law, which as you know, is an international customary law. So it sounds to me like what you're describing is a new kind of space race. You started at the top of your answer very interestingly talking about global treaties back in the 1960s that lots of countries signed up to and over time, fewer treaties, less and less being ratified, and individual nation states making their own legislation. The Outer Space Treaty was conceived in the 1960s when the biggest concern was the placement of nuclear weapons in space. So the two main uh, countries that brought this treaty and the United Kingdom was the, uh, was the United States and the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, right? So the USSR or the Soviet Union as we uh, knew it. So that was the concern. Uh, at that time, the concept of space resource utilization, the, con the concept that even satellites that are used so much today was not into the public imagination or a concept like satellite internet. So fast forward to today, uh, what is interesting is that the Outer Space Treaty itself allows nations to pass national legislation because within the Outer Space Treaty, States are responsible for the behavior of their private space actors as well as private citizens. So they are obligated 
to pass national legislation that will regulate and uh, support the Outer Space Treaty in responsible behavior in space. Now, today, the, the situation is that there is, there is this uh, scramble, if I may, to get to the moon. For example, China is the first country to conceive of a lunar program that talked about extraction of resources like helium-3 for nuclear fusion, uh, as well as uh, water ice and other elements. India is also starting to have that focus, but there is a difference. So while uh, India talks about the Chandrayaan-3 program, for example, talked about collecting data for exploration and scientific purposes, the Chinese space program directed by Wu Wering is very clear. Their focus is on utilizing lunar resources for economic development of China. So there, there is a clear difference. And also because space contributes to national security and has dual use purpose, it is extremely difficult to come to a consensus even within the United Nations as to what is responsible behavior, who decides what is responsible, uh, what is behavior itself? Can you have norms that dictate behavior or you focus on actual capacity and treaty-based obligations? So there is actually a lack of consensus as to how treaties today are going to be conceptualized. All right. Let's move to Pranav now. Pranav, tell us how does space fit into India's national security plans and policies? Uh, for quite a long time, uh... Indian space program did not really have much of a military element, uh, even though quite a number of ISRO scientists did go on to work on the missile. Uh, Indian space program and the missile program had very little in common. Uh, the Indian space program, in particular, the, Indian, the rockets that ISRO designed were all liquid fuel based, whereas the missiles were solid fuel, uh, which, uh, which are quite different from having a liquid fuel missile, which takes a longer time to uh, be launched. Uh, but by the 2000s, especially when China, or especially after the Kargil War, uh, the Kargil Review Committee, after the Kargil War with Pakistan, uh, a committee known as the Kargil Review Committee, had a major uh, study done on what were the requirements of the Indian Army uh, and the Indian Armed Forces after the war. And they concluded that one of the things that India did not have was autonomous uh, space capabilities that uh, would that would allow India to know what's happening on the ground because uh, India depended quite a lot on uh, foreign satellite images. So uh, during that time, it was concluded that India needs to build up its uh, civilian and military uh, satellite capabilities. Uh, since then, uh, the armed forces have contracted with the commercial arm of ISRO to build satellites, for example, uh, both the Army and the Navy have their own communication satellites, uh, whereas the Air Force has just contracted ISRO's commercial arm uh, to build a communication satellite. And, and to some extent, uh, uh, Indian Armed Forces have also used civilian satellites, uh, ISRO civilian satellites, for gathering data on weather and on uh, certain images of terrain. But uh, in 2019, when India tested its actually satellite weapon, that, that, that's when the seriousness of militarization uh, began uh, and uh, Indian military started thinking very seriously, so much so that uh, they had a dedicated defense space agency that was set up. And uh, Indian on, only right now is uh, are the Indian armed forces taking space very seriously. Uh, however, uh, because India was uh, not focusing on military space capabilities for quite a long time, uh, the actual capabilities that India has on the military front in space are quite limited. Pranav, then give us an idea of what the sentiment is, since you are in Delhi. Does India feel like it's lagging behind? Is there anxiety that, that it, it poses security risks, especially looking at Pakistan, looking at China, um, that India really needs to, you know, put the pedal to the metal, so to speak, and, and catch up, at least in, in, in perception, uh, in terms of its space technology and, as you said, its ability to operate autonomously in space? Yeah, most certainly, uh, because especially after the anti-satellite test of uh, 2019, the sentiment has been that um, the government has not let the private sector thrive enough. And therefore, um, a lot of people within the government have begun to realize that um, private sector is a key enabler of space capabilities, uh, which is why um, back in April, the uh, union government released the Indian space policy of 2023. Uh, now, which allows private industry to do a lot of things, not just uh, gather launch satellites, but also 
uh, sell satellite data and uh, perform a whole load of other missions. For example, launch uh, high-end communication satellites and uh, co-coordinate with other bodies to make sure that they get authorization uh, much faster than before. So uh, the sentiment right now is that um, ISRO and the government bodies have a very limited capacity. But on the other hand, the private industry has much, much greater technologies to offer. And therefore, uh, it's time to harness to those private cap capabilities in order to uh, in order to fulfill the uh, military and the civilian ambitions of the Indian space program. There's still this um, idea that India doesn't really have, you know, blocks of allies that it always sticks with. In what way does India's space program reflect that that kind of policy? Uh, I think the best way it reflects is that we saw in July that uh, Prime Minister Modi went to the United States and uh, India uh, signed the Artemis Accords. Uh, now, signing the Artemis Accords was a big step for India because historically, um, India has not uh, acknowledged or, or even uh, paid attention to unilateral treaties, for example, or treaties or agreements. Uh, the Artemis Accords, uh, as far as India is concerned, is a... Uh, is a project of the United States and its allies uh, to protect uh, the Western interests and sort of bring others into the fold. Uh, but India did sign on to this, uh, uh, this accords. And in one way, it showed that India was quite close to the United States. But a few weeks later, Prime Minister Modi went to France and uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, Pre 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 President Macron signed a, a, a great deal of agreements. Among these were more practical agreements related to space where uh, India and France uh, would send a, a highly advanced satellite in the coming years. And uh, they also signed a letter of intent to build a new reusable rocket. So when you see what's going on, um, India is trying to balance its interests. On one hand, it wants to be a part of what's going on with the United States in the West, where uh, the Atoms Accords wants to advance uh, certain, uh, certain rules regarding the governance of the moon. But on the other hand, India also wants to be a part uh, of uh, be, be a partner with countries that offer more tangible benefits in the near future. For example, France. Um, India and France have been partners since the 1980s. Um, India's rocket engines, uh, liquid rocket engines, which are used in the PSLV today. PSLV is uh, one of India's workhorse rockets. And uh, these engines were derived from French designs uh, earlier. So India and France, India, the Indian and French partnership reflects that India does not have to depend on one country, but rather it can spread out its risks and have uh, partners across geographies and across geopolitical lines uh, to make sure that its interests are secure. So, Namrata, historically, India has collaborated with Russia, USSR at that time, and now India is signing these accords with US and France, as Pranav uh, put it. What does that really mean for India's relations with Russia? Do we have Namrata there? I, I think speaking speaking of uh, the importance of space technology, right? The internet connection, yeah. I believe. Uh, we lost Namrata. So maybe, Pranav, you can answer that question since you mentioned US and France. What does that mean for India's relationship with Russia? Uh, India's relationship with Russia, particularly with regard to space, has been declining for quite a while. Uh, in 2015, um, India and the Russian Space Agency uh, tried to get an agreement where uh, India would be able to buy the rover for its Chandrayaan-2 mission. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Russians were not able to deliver on the rover because of their own internal issues. Um, and since then, um, Indian and Russian partnership has been on a steady decline. And uh, this has been worsened because uh, Russian space capabilities itself have been dwindling. Um, Russia has not carried out any major space mission um, like the United States. Um, it tried to send the lunar mission rover uh, earlier this year, but it failed. But even on the lower orbit side, uh, Russia has been largely focusing on building its military capabilities in space. Uh, so Indian and Russian collaboration have largely been stagnant for the past six years. And uh, I believe that this trend will continue on, unless Russia is able to uh, get back on its feet uh, and uh, offer something meaningful for India. Uh, until and unless Russia is able to offer something meaning meaningful in such a way that India and Russia are equal partners. Um, I do not think uh, the Indian and Russian partnership is going to go very far. 
kind of we've talked a lot about military uh, interests here, and we might go back to it because there's, of course, much more to talk about. But in terms of commercial interests, we heard at the top of this episode talking about weather forecasting, other kinds of geospatial, you know, geolocation kind of um, uh, practicalities, even e-commerce. What are the commercial implications now and looking ahead into the near future for Indian companies? Uh, for Indian companies right now, uh, the biggest market is in analyzing satellite images and satellite data. Um, often the most boring parts of space is actually the data that we receive from satellites. So the images that satellites take, for example, um, are, 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 only, are only useful once they have been processed uh, by specialized companies or through specialized software. And right now, this is what the Indian industry is really good at, uh, that what we call the downstream industry, where we're able to use satellite data for a variety of applications. So commercially right now, um, the downstream industry will take a satellite images from other companies and uh, use these images and use this data to uh, advance agriculture, to advance construction in urban areas uh, for uh, mineral prospecting, especially in the mining industry and uh, perhaps other applications uh, such as a disaster management and disaster monitoring. Uh, but as Indian companies begin to mature and as they receive more funding, um, the, the real business is going to be in uh, communication satellites and in providing uh, multispectral sensors. So what I mean by multispectral is not just the images that we see on Google Earth, but images that are uh, in black and white that uh, are only reflecting radar. So earth penetrating satellites. So these are images that can see partially underground. Um, these are the kind of satellite images and satellite data that's going to be very important. And Indian satellite, Indian private satellites will play an important role in uh, having a important, uh, having a large share in the global market. Um, but other than that, uh, I do not see uh, moon missions. Uh, I think Indian companies are still far behind um, in launching uh, missions to the moon or building heavy lift rockets like SpaceX or Blue Origin. Um, most Indian launch companies right now are focusing on placing satellites up to 500 kilograms in low Earth orbit. So the launch market is still going to be limited, but the satellite data market and the uh, low, Earth, low Earth orbit satellites are going to be uh, far greater contributors to the Indian space economy. All right, it's good to have Namrata back. A big quick question: We were talking, we were talking to Pranav about, um, you know, India's, you know, interests. Uh, you know, as we know, it is it doesn't like to align itself too closely with any particular country or any particular group of countries, and its space program reflects that. From a U.S. perspective, since you're in the U.S., is that should the U.S. be welcoming and uh, welcoming India's space program? Are there reasons to worry about it from a U.S. interest perspective? How is how are U.S. policymakers looking at developments of the Indian space uh, program? Before I answer that question, I actually wanted to uh, offer a little bit of my insight into India's uh, national security space policy. So I think there is, that is where India is uh, behind, as Pranav was mentioning, not just in terms of technology, but also in terms of policy. So if you look at the Indian space policy of 2023, to me, it appears to be much more of a document that uh, talks about how India's institutional structures will change so that India can uh, enable private space investment. So it's more like a bureaucratic explanation as to which agencies will be uh, in charge, for example, to give licensing. But I think a space policy document should go much beyond that. So if you look at space policy documents that come out of the US or China or Russia, uh, there is much more clarity in terms of what is a country's civilian space program, but also what are the focuses of a civilian space program, as well as what is its national security space policy. India does not seem to be giving clarity in that regard. Now, having said that, what is interesting is that I think China's anti-satellite weapon test in 2007 uh, the fact that China can destroy Indian satellite support structures if it wants to. Uh, China has also developed non-kinetic anti-satellite weapon like laser power beaming, as well as microwave capability or attack on ground stations through cyber. I think those are all concerns for India. 
The reason there is a concern is because India has a disputed border with China, both in the eastern side. I come from northeast India, from the state of Assam, and Arunachal is right there that in China claims, as well as uh, the western border. And the 2020 conflict we saw from Maxar, which is an American private company, images that uh, verified that China's People's Liberation Army were building structures on the Indian side of the line of actual control that led to the conflict. So I think those are the reasons why there is a push for national security space, as well as calls from the chief of defense staff that India needs to develop non-kinetic capability as well, and where the private sector will play a role. And then institutions like the Defense Space Agency, which is the Indian version of the Space Force that has been thought through. But there is still no clarity as to what an Indian military space doctrine will be. And without that kind of clarity, there will, of course, be a lot of ambiguity. Now, why I say that, because that results in strategic concern as to where the Indian space program is actually going. And so from the U.S. perspective, now to answer your question, should the U.S. uh, be welcoming of India? I think if you look at uh, India-U.S. relationship, it's not just pushed, for example, in terms of space. There has been growing convergence between the two nations in terms of strategic opportunities and threats since 2000 with Bill Clinton's visit, uh, then with George W. Bush visit and India signing the nuclear deal in 2005, and then fast forward to defense partnerships as well as partnerships which are comprehensive. Space forms a part of that. So when the United States has taken the strategic decision that it wants to build a much closer strategic partnership with India, space is a part of that larger comprehensive strategic partnership. And so if you look at the uh, joint statement that India and the U.S. signed when Prime Minister Modi visited uh, the U.S., uh, there are other technologies like quantum, artificial intelligence, robotics, and space that are going to be part of that effort. Now, the U.S. also has strategic reasons why it's uh, welcoming of India. One is that it's also pushed by the desire to have a strategic alignment structure, for example, in regard to space technology, including the moon, that uh, India's contribution creates legitimacy. As Pranav was mentioning, India never signs on to unilateral Western originated alignment structures, but has done so with the Artemis Accord, and that's a big win for U.S. strategic diplomacy. And so that's the reason why the U.S. would be welcoming. And also because signing on to the accord means that India will also be committing to certain uh, framework that will be developed by the Artemis Accord in, in regard to how the moon's resources will be utilized. And so that's a big forward movement in terms of guidelines. Now, finally, I'll end by saying that both nations have a strategic concern, which is China. And so China has an international lunar research station that it has thought through and developed, and Russia is a partner. And now Venezuela has signed in, South Africa has signed in, and Pakistan has said that it might sign onto that particular Chinese-led international lunar station as well. So for both India and the U.S., one of the concern is to ensure both a free Indo-Pacific as well as access to space that remains free and democratically uh, acceptable and open to all. And so those are the strategic calculations on both sides that have resulted in both countries deciding to collaborate, not just, for example, on lunar development, but also India and the U.S. have signed an agreement where they will have a strategic partnership in regard to human space flight program where India benefits by collaborating with the US. Indian astronauts will train in the Johnson Space Center, as well as the very critical agreement that both nations will launch a joint mission to the International Space Station next year. So there are strategic reasons as well as technological reasons why both nations have come together in terms of space but it is connected to their larger grand strategic vision. Would you call that a shift in power with India and U.S. on the one side and Russia and China on the other side? There are very clear strategic alignments forming in terms of how space is being conceptualized. So on one hand, you have a U.S.-initiated Artemis Accords that India has signed. On the other hand, you have China-Russia. So you can clearly see that there are alignment structures forming, and both structures are not really deciding or have made any kind of suggestion that they would work together in terms of this particular movement. I think 
and that is why I think there are alignment structures forming in space. Now, India is a very interesting example. So if you look at the Indian uh, external affairs minister's speech, for example, at the United Nations uh, General Assembly, uh, what he pointed out is that India is a leading nation. And so India will make its strategic decisions in terms of foreign policy based on its national interest. So it's in the national interest of India to build a strong partnership with the U.S. So India might be a partner in terms of the Artemis Accords, but whether it would want to build into that narrative that this is a strategic alignment, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, Russia, is something I don't think India will uh, very officially uh, declare to. So there are structures forming, but whether the narrative is going to get so coalesced and consensus on this is an alignment vis-a-vis -vis China, Russia, we are not clear. I think the Indian decision to join the uh, US-led or US-initiated Artemis Accord is because of the fact that India has a, a, a life conflict with China and China and Russia have taken decisions recently to become very close, including a strategic partnership, uh, President Xi Jinping implicitly supporting Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as jointly developing not just lunar mission, but planetary defense. So there are clear signal that Russia is also giving that the most important partnership for Russia today is uh, not uh, India or the US, but actually China. So those are the reasons. Is India's voice, uh, has it become more important on the global front when it comes to space? I'll, I'll let Pranab answer that first and then I'll go second. India still feels quite left out because uh, it, it still feels that um, it's not being taken in the first circle of uh, spacefaring nations. And that's partly true. But on the other hand, uh, the United States really, really wanted India to sign on to the Artemis Accords, uh, as Dr. Goswami mentioned. Uh, India being a spacefaring nation, India being the fourth country to land in the moon has very big implications. So, you know, in, so, so, the, so, so, so therefore, uh, when India signed on to the Artemis Accords, it provided massive legitimacy to what the United States was trying to accomplish with uh, the Artemis program and the Artemis Accords. So India's voice is being recognized as more important, but India itself feels that it is not being heard enough. Um, and I just want to point out a, a slight peculiarity with India's space policy. Uh, so Dr. Goswami mentioned that um, in, uh, in India has signed the Artemis Accords, but and it has in some way aligned with the US to a greater extent. But on the other hand, um, in 2022, when uh, US Vice President Kamala Harris announced that the US will unilaterally ban uh, ground-based, uh, ground-launched anti-satellite testing, uh, India did not sign on to that uh, unilateral proposal. Uh, India did not commit to uh, not testing anti-satellite weapons because it felt that uh, Russians and the Chinese had a, a, a greater sense of criticism towards the U.S., particularly as Dr. Goswami mentioned earlier, um, India does not agree with how the West uh, frames responsible behavior or irresponsible behaviors in outer space. So India, like as, as uh, the foreign minister said, India is very interested to align with the United States in having lunar governance frameworks, but India is still extremely reluctant to partner with the United States when it comes to forming international legal mechanisms to uh, have uh, to, to, to govern space security and uh, space safety. So those are some really odd peculiarities with Indian foreign policy. I think to answer your question, I would say that India's, if I, if I may use the word power in terms of its presence in the global space landscape has actually increased. And that is because if you look at how space influence and informing of decisions at the global level are informed by, it's through the capability that a nation showcases. So India has showcased launch capability. India has pretty mature satellite capability. And now India is, of course, the first nation to enter Mars orbit from Asia. Uh, China was the first nation to land on a on the Mars surface, but also India now has the capability to get to the moon and can use that technology for further missions. So having said that, that's the reason why I think India's uh, capability to inform, influence uh, space governance mechanisms, India's power, if we 
calculate power by capability and funding and space program has actually increased. And that is why nations like the United States was uh, so uh, persistent in terms of including India in the Artemis Accords uh, for legitimacy, but also for technology capability development. Now, as Pranav has said, what is interesting is that India has brought that particular uh, capability demonstration as well as space policy focus to the United Nations. It has abstained from signing on to the open-ended working group that is looking to uh, talk about responsible behavior, for example, with military space capability. India has resisted from uh, agreeing to the U.S. moratorium on anti-satellite weapon. But I would say that that particular <clears throat> resistance is not so much that this is a U.S.-led or U.S.-initiated program, but because of the concern by the Global South and India as a representative of that, that if you only have norms that are guiding principles that talks about how a particular activity should not be conducted, that does not have the force of law. So the Indian representative's perspective is that if you really want to talk about responsible behavior, mil uh, ensure that militarization of space is not happening with say anti-satellite weapons and other activity, India and the Global South are more comfortable with a treaty-based international space order that, that is much more legally uh, obligatory, and so it creates obligations for states. Otherwise, a nation that has very developed space capability can violate the norm and does not face any consequences from a legal perspective. So I think that is why India is uh, actually bringing its power and its influence to the discourse on space governance, challenging Western norm-based guidelines to then point out that what is required is a treaty-based uh, system. So I would say that India's space power is actually very visible, both at the uh, level of itself, its identity as a nation, bilaterally, as well as in multilateral forums. Pranav, based on that information, what would it take for India to actually sign on to one of these, a, a, a treaty like this? Um, for on the security side, uh, I think um, the, 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 the lowest uh, bar for India is to have a legally binding agreement. Um, I have been following the open-ended working group. So this was uh, for listeners, open-ended working group uh, for reducing space threats was a mechanism to fast track um, se space security uh, laws and space security uh, norms. Um, and India since uh, the first day of the proceedings has been calling for legally binding agreements. Uh, so the bare minimum is legally binding agreements, which is also uh, heavily supported by China and Russia. Uh, albeit in a slightly different variation. So for India, having a legally binding instrument is uh, the bare minimum. And this has been India's position since the 1980s. I went back to the archives and tried to look at what statements India made about anti-satellite weapons in the 1980s. And India was still calling for legally binding instruments. So um, I think India will accept nothing less than legally binding instruments, or at least something closer to guidelines. So uh, I think in 2019, uh, the United Nations, uh, one of the UN bodies had guidelines for space sustainability. So similarly, although this is not legally binding, uh, it was a document uh, signed by consensus. Uh, similarly, uh, something that at least comes by consensus would be acceptable to India. Thank you so much for putting things in perspective. I think we've learned a lot. India's lunar mission, solar mission, uh, we know there's Mars, there's Venus uh, also in the pipeline, uh, the manned mission. So a lot happening and um, understanding everything from whether it's um, e-education, whether it is satellites uh, for agriculture, for um, talking here in the studio because <laughs> and making our internet connections uh, exactly. stable we're right talking uh, we are here in germany and our guests are in india and the us would not have happened without the satellites yeah? a lot of for as much as we've uh for as far as we've come along in space technology there's still so, clearly what we've heard today from pranav and namrata so much more to go in terms of technology scientific discovery but also the strategic and the security and the political side of things very much uh, down here on earth Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for Thank having you. us. So are we heading for a new international space order? What do you think? Do let us know your thoughts. If you're watching us on YouTube, do leave a comment. And we're also available wherever you get your podcast. So if you find us on any of those platforms, subscribe and let us know what you think.
I'm William Glucroft. I'm Isha Bhatia Sadhan, signing off. Global Arms, a new take on security policy by DW.